as I was thinking about um, the prayer for today, I was thinking about what's been shaping and informing me. This is a picture of my youngest daughter, Adeline, who's four. Um, yes, uh, as I was trying to finalize my presentation and she said, I'm on my break, mama. Can I just come get a quick kiss that ended up being um, probably closer to 30 minutes of her sitting on my lap, asking all sorts of questions about this presentation and why I knew so much about this stuff. And I, I sort of jokingly said, I'm not sure I know anything about any of this stuff as I'm preparing it. I feel a bit um, like a fraud because we're all just trying to figure out wearing all these hats together at the same time. Um, and so I just, uh, when I was thinking about the prayer, I was thinking about um, a poem from um, Morgan Harper Nichols, uh, who is someone who I, I sort of lean on her book of poetry at times. And so I thought I'd share that um, and then go into the prayer for today. So amidst all the pressure to keep going and to keep going, may you also take time to learn the art of being, being loved, being held, being seen, being in the presence of the one who calls you to rest. For beyond your accomplishments and your calendars and your lists, you were made with purpose and intention to reflect glorious light and to abide in love that reminds you even in the pause, you are still where you need to be. So I want to sort of um, move into our prayer, um, asking God to um, guide us in knowing when to speed up and to sort of move forward with courage and also to slow down for those moments when our loved ones are wanting to sit on our lap and give us kisses. Um, in the moments of the hustle, may we also remember the moments of stillness. Um, may we walk in God's grace and light um, through everything that we do, knowing that sometimes what it's being, what's being called of us by him is to be still and silent um, or being bold and courageous, and that we can sit in the knowing that he is guiding us in all of those directions. Um, and may we also find time during this um, new, new normal, as it's called, um, to learn about what it is that we want and desire in our connection with God and in our connection with our faith, and that we may be forever guided in that journey. In our name we pray, amen. So I sort of started by saying, you know, yesterday, the example of yesterday, my daughter who um, is four, right, in the middle of the work day, uh, asking me to sort of stop in the middle of her school day break, asking um, for, for some attention to me. And there was this fabulous uh, Dolly Parton meme about what work looks like now in a global pandemic, right? We work for 10 minutes, then we sort of break for 35 minutes, and then we work some more for 15 minutes. Um, there's a fascinating article that was published. It was not um, a peer-reviewed journal, but a, a couple um, who are both professors did an informal study. They took a three-hour block of time. They have two children, and in the three-hour block of time, there were 45 interruptions, and the average uninterrupted stretch of work time was three minutes and 24 seconds. The longest uninterrupted stretch of work time was 19 minutes and 35 seconds, the shortest being merely seconds between interruptions. They graphed out the interruptions, and this is what the morning looked like. The sort of yellow uh, or the lighter yellow is uninterrupted. The darker orange is interrupted by one child and the pink is interrupted by the second child in the middle of the interruption. Uh, so you can see that we're being called um, in this new way of working from home, in this new way of um, being um, that we don't always have the focused attention that we have. And this is important to think about when we're thinking about wearing hats. For many of us, hats that we're wearing are professional ones. Um, they are ones in which we are called to professional obligations, um, whether that be volunteerism, whether that be board member positions, whether that be our occupation. Um, and the research on focus tells us that it can take up to 20 minutes to get back on track from an interruption. So when we think about 
the interrupt, this interruption chart, that it can take us 20 minutes from these interruptions to get back on track. But within that 20 minutes, we might be reinterrupted again. Additionally, the quality of work declines. And typically, when people return back to the work after the interruption, they're skipping steps or repeating steps they've already completed, meaning our time is not only um, the quality is not declining, but we might be repeating work, meaning we're doing something we've already done, or um, we're skipping steps, meaning there might be more errors in our work. So our personal responsibilities interrupt our professional ones, which interrupt our personal ones, and we feel we're failing at all of our jobs. It's this vicious cycle where in that moment of being with my daughter, I felt I was not holding the obligation to the, this presentation today because I was not getting it done. And in trying to get my presentation done, I felt like I was ignoring bids for connection from my daughter, right? And in both of those, I worried, am I gonna show up as being professional? Am I gonna show up as being loving and caring and present? And these are going through, um, we're going through this dance, right? This push and pull all day long in our current sort of position. So we have to remember, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back one slide. Um, we also know that um, pre-pandemic research demonstrates that working from home heightens both stress job and family conflict, especially when having um, to multitask when children are home. So that can increase stress, um, which also is problematic because we don't have the separation of going to work or coming home from work. We, ha we don't have that, um, sort of role shift that our minds can do, the drive home, right? I don't know about any of you, but when I used to work in office, I would listen to podcasts, going to work to get me sort get my brain sort of thinking critically and knowledgeably. And on my way home, I would listen to music to sort of calm my brain. I no longer have those work transitions. I might jump off of this presentation today and dive right into my daughter's Zoom meeting and have to switch from being presenter to being first grade teacher. Um, and then we also have found that preliminary COVID research highlights the unequal division of labor, especially that women are carrying the educational burden for their children. Whether or not you're actually supporting your child, um, in my case, I'm very lucky I have um, my mother and father who are helping do the educational um, distance learning for my youngest daughter, um, but I am still carrying the educational burden in terms of contacting her teacher, making sure she has the materials she needs, coordinating the Zoom schedules, making sure that my parents have the Zoom schedules that they need to get her to where she needs to be. So even if we're not enacting the actual education for our kids, there is a lot of unseen labor that's happening that predominantly falls on um, women in these um, dynamics. So any discussion about health and health-related behaviors is a discussion about families. We're here today as women, but we are also embedded in systems of families. And um, in my case, that's a multi-generational system. So I am embedded in the system as a child to my parents and also a parent to my children. And we are all functioning in this um, you know, three-level generational system as we try to navigate the, the bounds of what um, living in a pandemic looks like. Uh, and so it's important that we talk about um, health and health-related behaviors and about families in those decisions. In this time, it's easy to focus on what am I doing for work or what am I doing for my kids' education, but there's also so much more to that. What are we doing to create social connection, emotional connection? How are we supporting our health and wellness? And that's really what I'm going to focus on today in our presentation. Um, so what I wanna invite is um, some information about families and health and health-related behaviors as it relates to the pandemic. And then I'll provide some information about some theories that can help inform us uh, and that might support us. And then I'm gonna give you guys three tips or tools that might be meaningful in helping you navigate a pandemic at this time. So let's look at the impact of this pandemic on family life. This is preliminary and theoretical, so we will always be getting more and more information as we have, as we're sort of in this state longer and longer. But to start, we have direct effects. So this can be threats, direct uh, threats to health. So someone contracting coronavirus. Um, this can also be avoiding and surviving infection. So um, 
threats to health might mean um, contracting a mild case of coronavirus that um, you know sort of comes through your family and has maybe minimal impacts to larger impacts of uh, someone in your family contracting coronavirus and um, unfortunately ending up in the hospital on a respirator or losing their life to coronavirus. We also have to think about the ways in which the global pandemic has us changing the ways we interact as an attempt to avoid or to survive infection. If we are infected, do we need to quarantine, self-quarantine um, for an extended period of time? Do we have to shift the way that we interact in the world? If we have a family member who's immunocompromised, how are we then shifting when we go to the grocery store, how we do our grocery shopping, how we interact with friends and family members, if we can or can't interact with family members as a way of protecting our loved one who might be compromised. Um, we also, uh, some of us might be experiencing loss of family members, increased unemployment or changes in employment. So um, diminished work hours for those who are furloughed, um, decreased, I heard somewhere that dentists are seeing less patients now. So um, if you were a dentist, less people are going in for teeth cleanings, just trying to avoid exposure, right? So there's lots of ways that we might see increased unemployment or changes in employability or um, amount of employability, which leads to financial vulnerabilities. And then there's a loss of what was supposed to be and what could have been. Um, for anyone who had any medical procedures or any vacations planned, perhaps those have been canceled or postponed. Um, you know, I had some friends who were supposed to, you know, had a knee injury and that was supposed to be repaired and they had to go on prolonged with knee pain because the surgery was canceled for the time being. Um, my parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary and were supposed to take this once in a lifetime sort of trip, international trip. Uh, that they had splurged on and unfortunately it was in April and so it was canceled. So this idea of this loss of uh, what was supposed to be this grand celebration for them had to sort of be reimagined into something different and something new. And we have indirect uh, effects. So this can be intense periods um, for family life. What is it like to be all in the same home uh, for extended periods of time? For many of us, this is not something that we have ever experienced. Um, I'm used to my children going to school or going to daycare during the day and then coming home to me. So I have sort of this period of working and then having them home. Um, and that allows for some shift. It allows for me to focus on the things that I need to focus on and then be present for them when they come home. And having us all in the same, um, in the same quarters, that creates some intensity. Also intensity around setting boundaries for your family. If, if you, for some reason or another, want to limit contact what does that mean in terms of who you get to see and how they respond to that? I have um, <clears throat> a, a family that I'm working with right now who has decided to um, continue to shelter in place or to um, uh, enact sort of more conservative stay at home orders. And a lot of their extended family is feeling very rejected by this. And they're taking it as a personal insult as if there's something wrong with the extended family when the clients that I'm working with are just trying to keep their family as safe as possible. Um, uh, and this is, uh, the indirect effects can be governed by unique and powerful external boundaries. Some of these might be imposed by systems that we're functioning in. Um, with my daughter going back to school now um, and being in person, my first grader, I tend to be more cautious about when we go out and who we go out with. Uh, because I want to make sure that she's not, we're not exposing her to anything that she might then take to school and expose her classmates to, right? So thinking about how these shifts in how we are realigning the structures of who we interact with might be evolving and changing and create indirect effects on how we um, function as a family and as a community. There's all the dialectic, right? The things of heroic family closeness. I don't know about anybody else, but um, in, in the wake of having my kids home all the time, we started doing hiking Thursdays. Every Thursday we go and find hikes and we come together and we hike. And it has been one of the most fabulous things as um, my parents have felt more comfortable, they've started joining us. So we start seeing sort of the intergenerational connectedness of going out and being in the wilderness, um, hiking. Um, this also connects to physical health and well-being, being out in the sun which is great for our mental health, being out exercising, also great for our mental health, but also the closeness of family. What does this mean um, 
my daughters and I lived for three years in Texas and just recently moved back. And so for them, it has been sort of a learning of who their grandparents are. There's lots of storytelling that happens on our hikes, um, which has created a lot of closeness within my families. They've heard stories about me from my parents that they'd never heard before. So they're seeing me in a way. Um, we've also been seeing resilience. Um, and also on the flip side of that, there's been um, family stress and conflict that for some families being in these close quarters has been really a trial and tribulation. My work currently is um, predominantly with couples and families. I don't really do much individual work. Um, and in my couples work, I've seen couples who in this time of pandemic have been able to come together once sort of the distractions of life were stripped away and they were left sort of alone in their house together, that they were able to come together and connect and others that when the distractions of life were stripped away, um, they realized that uh, they didn't want to work on the relationship anymore and they decided to end their marriage. Um, and so we sort of see the dialectic of that, that the conflicts that the sort of distractions were buffering from were no longer available to them. Um, and so in, in the absence of them, the conflict and stress was too great. Um, and for others, it was what was needed to bring them closer together. Um, and so we can see both of those impacts. There's some early research out of China that's showing um, that they are also experiencing increased um, divorce as a result of the stay-at-home orders. So this is not something that's unique to the United States that we're seeing this in other areas. And we don't really have the long-term research at this point, but preliminary research is saying that um, these stay-at-home orders that were implemented um, are causing uh, shifts in family structures. And then there's unique impacts. So families who receive support outside to care for family members may experience an absence of the caregiver. Um, this is if you have someone who comes in like a nanny or an in-home healthcare provider, um, family members who maybe have elders living with them might now be responsible for being the primary caregiver to that elderly person um, or to the child. Um, this might also be families who are in, um, uh, residential facilities, they might have less access. I know we've probably at this point all seen videos of families, you know, greeting their loved ones through glass windows um, at, um, at residential facilities or at elder care facilities. So there is this new shift in what happens. Also for separating divorced and remarried families, they may experience new opportunities for conflict related to custody. How much do you have to share about who you're in contact with? Um, if you're um, you know, divorced or remarried, who, how, what is the level of exposure? Are you choosing to change your custody schedule to reduce the exposure of your kids? Um, all of these things are important to consider. And then what happens if there is um, exposure to, to COVID or to coronavirus? Um, how might that then shift sort of for these um, separating divorced or remarried families? How might that then prompt a shift in the custody schedule that might be disruptive to the family um, and how they're interacting? And then lastly, there's disrupted um, family life cycle transitions. So anyone who has a child who is launching into college um, that may not be launching in the same ways, right? They're sort of launching to the computer rather than launching to a dorm room. Um, that can be a huge shift. Um, it can be those of you um, who maybe had loved ones who were planning to get married, um, who, who were planning different sort of stages of life, transitions, that those might have been disrupted. Um, you know, or canceled or postponed. And then lastly, challenges for those who depend on rituals for connection. And this could be anything from church or Alcoholics Anonymous or family dinners, that we might not be able to do those things in the ways that we could before, that they might look different, they might be virtual now. And how do we interact in those ways? How do we find faith and connection um, when uh, we are, you know, sort of longing for that community and it's only available virtually. For those in the community who are older, who maybe are not as tech savvy, how do they find the support they need to navigate technological platforms so that they can meaningfully connect in these ways? Um, and then for others who are seeking support um, through Alcoholics Anonymous or other sort of mental health support groups um, or recovery groups, how might those be disrupted and create new vulnerabilities but also new opportunities for connection in new ways. 
So I want to take a pause really quick here before we transition into sort of like the theories that I'm about to present. I want to sort of open up and see if there's any questions about anything we've talked about thus far about impacts of the pandemic on family life. I'm sort of curious from you guys about which of these you've experienced, um, you know, sort of direct effects or indirect effects, the things you're sort of being called to navigate at this time. It's amazing to me. Thank you for for this presentation. It's really good. <laughs> I'm amazed at how you have captured what's going on in our lives now and packaged it in such a way that I believe most of us, if not all of us, are saying, yes, yes. Exactly. You got me. You got me. Well, I'm just amazed that you did a fantastic job with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, having listened to this and uh, considered my own situation, I am amazed that my thoughts come around to my ancestors mm -hmm. and how you know, we, we are very much concerned about what's going on in our world today. I think of my ancestors and the struggles that they had, and I get encouraged. And I know that if they could have babies while picking cotton, you know, you know if they could... Um, just endure the pain and the suffering that they did and still provide a way for me to be here. Mm. Um, I take courage from that. And, and I find that no matter what comes and no matter what goes, if they could build churches and build universities, if they could educate their children, not just technically, but spiritually and emotionally. If, if I could be the, um, the evidence of their labor, I think we're going to make it out of this. No matter what COVID-19 ends up, no matter how it ends up impacting our world, we have the strength, the resilience, and we stand on the shoulders of those who will help us make it out of this. Uh, I, and, and I also think that the feminist movement, the womanist movement, all of that did a great job of helping us as women um, but this is what you have identified this morning. This is precisely where the movements may have failed us, or the movements got derailed, and that happens all the time with movements. Um, perhaps it got derailed, and this is a piece that uh, was not attended to. And you today, Veronica, have, I'm sorry, Dr. Kuhn, have nailed it. You have nailed it. Thank you for bringing us back to where, where we need to be. I appreciate you and your presentation. Thank you, Dean Williams. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I think it's so important that we do come back to this idea of family and community and interconnectedness that I think is often overlooked um, when we're thinking about what's happening right now, right? The, every experience that we're having right now, um, there's this meme and it's a mom with her cup of coffee and she looks out the window and there's like a nuclear bomb exploding and she looks out the window the next day and there's like wild animals, you know, and it's sort of this like joke, like every day there's some new surprise out the window, right? Um, that every sort of turn that we've had along the way um, from a global pandemic to racial injustice to, the upcoming election. All of this is a call to 
connect more with our community and to be really intentional about our connectedness and um, about sort of what it is that's driving us to build a better community and a better society for ourselves in the same ways, you know, Dean Williams, as you so eloquently put, um, as our ancestors did before us, right? That we are sort of on, um, on the backs of the those uh, beyond us um, and for those ahead of us, right? That we are called to, to take this time and to evaluate, right? Um, thank you. I'm wondering what others are feeling called to in this time. Um, hi, Dr. Kuhn, this is Maria. How are you doing? Hi, Maria. Thanks I'm good, for being how are you? Here. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I think for me, it just reminds me of just the power of a village and support um, and how it's really important, I think, for women to come together, even if we can't come together physically. Um, but sometimes hearing how my friend's day went with her 10 month old, uh kind of helps validate and also um with the sharing of ideas um but my heart really sometimes hurts uh just understanding my privilege and my access and 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 the resources that i have um sometimes i'm really hurt about how um, i know that i'm doing this with resources but there are lots of moms out there that have a lot less than i do and um, a lot less access and sometimes i struggle with the idea with the idea of like maybe how i can help or or um so my heart goes there a lot mm -hmm. um but um yeah i think um, a village is really necessary um during mm -hmm. this time if nothing but just to have dialogue about how things are going um, and um, how we can support each other during this time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah, this idea of like, um, you know, uh, I have the same experience as you, Maria, of like, I feel very, very privileged that I have two, you know, my parents are relatively younger and they are retired, so they're available and they've been missing their grandbabies for the last three years when we were in Texas. So they are like eager and excited. They were like, they, you know, love the pandemic because they get so much more time with the kids because I need more help. Um, but it is right acknowledging the privilege embedded in that right of like that I have a resource that I can, you know, have my kids go to their house and I can have protected time to work or that I have a community that I can call on um, in moments um, if I need to run to the grocery store that my parents can come and help watch the kids so I don't have to take them and expose them unnecessarily to other environments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then Michelle, what can we do, right? right. Oh. Michelle Bloss added into the chat that she's been called to creative problem solving. Um, yeah. So married, she has a, a college son, a high school daughter. So, you know, just that in and of itself. But I think um, it's a great explanation of kind of where we all are and how we can face it is to get very yeah. creative with ourselves and those that are in our, our pod, if you will. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to sort of connect with what Maria was saying too, right? Is that like in those moments of when I can sort of acknowledge my privilege and that I have maybe these additional resources, like how can I then move into creative problem solving of how I can expand those? Because I can't say like, if if I have this help, then I can go help others. It's not that easy anymore, right? Because I have to think about like who I can interact with, how I can interact, uh, what feels comfortable, right? And so it's, it's created new ways of interacting um, and new ways of... Um, supporting community, right? Which requires creative problem solving. Um, yeah, and innovation. We're being called into innovation right now of how to connect as a community. Yeah, thank you guys. So this is a great transition then into theories of family systems and health. So how do we think about um, families and illness? Um, there's two sort of models that I rely on when I'm thinking about this work. I did quite a bit of work um, when I was at Loma Linda University during my PhD program, I worked with families who were um, awaiting organ transplantation, so liver, kidney, heart, lung um, transplants. And so these were sort of the models that I drew on. Um, and as I was thinking, as we were sort of entering into this pandemic and this illness crisis that we're in, I was thinking about um, even though we might all be healthy, you know, as it is 
free of coronavirus, that we are still in an illness experience because it is a community illness experience, right? Um, that my behaviors are shifted um, because I wash my hands more. I wear a mask now. I change how I grocery shop or I change how I go out in public. I change um, how I threw, you know, both my daughters had birthdays during um, our stay at home order. And so, you know, their birthday parties looked different. Um, all of these things are changing. How I do my work has changed that it's now virtual instead of in person. Um, and so these family illness model and the biopsychosocial spiritual model were sort of things I was calling on as I was trying to support myself in this process and sort of readdressed. And so that's what I'm bringing here to talk about today. So the family illness model was developed by John Rowland. This is actually a, a very, very old model. Um, over 20 years old, though, it has had some um, um, renovations done to it over the last few years and was recently um, sort of um, adjusted to consider sort of um, genetic testing and um, pre-illness onset. And that was um, an adaptation that was done in uh, about 2007. And so this family illness model is a way for us to think about how families and illness interact with one another. We have sort of like the family instrumental style, which is how we interact, how we sort of coordinate the day-to-day -day activities. And when we're talking about families here, we can be talking about households or we can be talking about extended families. My parents don't live in the same house as me, although I would consider them when I'm thinking about sort of um, our experience in this pandemic and thinking about the family illness model, they would be very much part of my family as I'm thinking about it because I interact with them several times a week. The ways in which we sort of, um, you know, create the ways we interact is very important. How we communicate to one another when we see each other and why we see each other is really important. Um, then we have our affective style of the family. So is this a family that's very emotive or is this a family that is less emotive, meaning they don't express a lot of emotions. They're sort of business, um, but not maybe so much emotional expressive, or are there differences within the family? So I'm a therapist, uh, so I talk about emotions all day long. Uh, my kids were raised by a therapist. They talk about emotions all day long. My parents are scientists. They do not talk about emotions <laughs> very much, right? And so it's this interesting interaction where my daughters will say like, I'm feeling kind of sad today. And I say, okay, let's talk about what that sadness means. And, you know, they go to my parents' house and the effective style there is different. You're feeling sad? Great, let's make you happy. Or like, you know, it's like instead of sitting in the emotional experience, which would be my approach as their parent, they get a very different affective experience or style from grandparents, right? So thinking about those interactions. Um, then we have development. This can be individual development. I have a four-year-old who's in TK. She's sort of on the brink of you know, testing independence, or not on the brink of testing, she tests independence. I have a first grader who's also sort of learning about doing things independently. So where they are on their individual sort of developmental cycles. Um, and then I am an adult, right, to my parents. I am an adult, um, but I also uh, am their child, right? So how does that then shift our development, right? They still try to parent me sometimes um, in front of my kids, right? I have to say like, this is a decision that I'm making and I'm an adult and I get to make this decision independently. Um, and then family development, right? So what does it mean to be a family with um, two young kids compared to my parents who are, um, you know, in their household, a family of um, a couple who is retired, right? Who has launched both of their children. What does that look like? And what does that mean for their development and how um, the impact of the pandemic might be different for both of us, right? Where I'm thinking about how do I interact socially um, with my kids? How do I get them the social interactions they need? They might not, my parents might not be thinking about that because they can easily transition onto Zoom. They're familiar with online, you know, they've been FaceTiming their friends internationally and across the nation, you know, for most of their, you know, technologically adult life. Um, and so this was an easy transition for them. They've moved a lot. And so they're used to sort of long distance relationships. So some of this was relatively easy. Um, and so thinking about how the impact might be based on the individual and family developmental um, stage of life. And then the next is paradigms and values. So what are the paradigms and values of the family that might shift or change as a result of the illness experience? And then transgenerational history, so illness, loss, and crisis. How do stories from our family inform how we show up today? 
my mother is in a group of women, there's four of them, and she's the only one left who's, um, who has a living husband. Uh, the other three, their husbands have all passed away at this point. And so for them, for her, she has a very strong story about like um, wanting to stay extra cautious and extra state safe. It's not lost on her that um, she's relatively privileged to have had this much time with my father um, compared to her, you know, four to her three best friends. And so she has this story of like, I've witnessed um, the loss of a spouse in my closest friends and, um, when she, when the pandemic came, she was very overly cautious for my father. He has some comorbid um, health issues, right, that would make him more at risk. And so that really showed up for her as part of this transgenerational history that she has um, and this story she has from her close community around illness, loss, and crisis. Um, then we have the ways these family factors impact or are in relationship with or dancing with the illness experience. So there's practical demands. These are like, we have to wash our hands more often. We have to wear masks. Um, you know, there's things like we, we had to do distance learning for some time. These are sort of the practical demands. If my child gets sick, how am I going to doctor's appointments? Um, am I going for the smallest things that I normally wouldn't go to? Or am I waiting to sort of check things out? Um, how are we sort of coordinating doing our work um, in the face of the illness, right? So we might not be, our family um, might not be impacted by COVID, but I'm thinking about how do I offer virtual learning for my students? How do I offer sort of accommodations for students who might be impacted? Now we're talking about, um, you know, when there were riots up in LA um, during this pandemic time, I had to think about, you know, students would have to miss class because the protesters outside their homes that were destroying property and it was not safe for them or they were very anxious to attend, attend class. Now with the wildfires, I have students who are having blackouts and it's preventing them. So I have to think about ways, sort of these practical demands um, that this pandemic has sort of put on the ways that we're administering sort of education, that we're interacting with people. This is all shifting the ways that we show up. Then we have the affective demands. So this is going to be the emotional experiences. Um, over the summer, my four-year-old was very tearful because she was very scared that coronavirus was going to prevent her from going to school. All she wanted, she's been home with me for the last year, all she wanted was to go to school like sister. And she was so sad when we had the stay-at-home order and we were doing distance learning because she was very scared that she wasn't going to be going to school. And so she was very sad about that. We had to hold that sadness and hold the sadness in the uncertainty of for most of the summer, we didn't know. We didn't know until two weeks ago if she was going to go in person or not, right? Um, so holding uncertainty with sadness and grief and loss. Um, while also, you know, that moment of her coming out, you know, yesterday she said, you know, when I was working, she came out and she said, I love that I can see you anytime when I'm at school right? So there's also this piece of joy, right? And it's the dialectic of both of those things. It's the sadness of I want to go to school and I want to be with kids my age and I want to be interacting with other kids. And I also love that I get to see my mom whenever I want to throughout the day. And I get to see grandma and grandpa and grandma gets to now be my teacher, right? There's like the excitement of that and there's specialty in that. Um, that's also part of the affective demand. So when we talk about affective demand, it's not just um, the difficult or unpleasant emotions, but it's also positive emotions that show up there. Um, then we have the developmental time phase. So you can think about this, about how the pandemic has progressed over time. Have we been, um, how have we been impacted in terms of when we had our initial stay at home order and our worlds got very small and isolating in our homes and now we've started to open up again. And then there have been times when we've had to contract and come back in, right? When um, maybe our numbers got too high or maybe a family member started to have um, health issues, whatever it might be, that these, these developmental phases um, in a lot of ways are uncertain right now, which create an added stress. We don't know what this will look like. We have developmental phases too around um, testing. Will there be enough testing? I was talking to um, our pediatrician the other day, and she mentioned that schools might go to daily testing, that testing might become so available that schools are going to do daily testing. And I was like, that I don't even understand what that, what would that even look like, right? Um, we also have um, developmental phases of building a vaccine or creating a vaccine. And what is the time frame of that? And how does that shift how we're interacting in the world so long as the pandemic is happening, so long as there is this concern for COVID-19, 
how are we sort of interacting across these time points as we sort of um, restrict our connection with people and then maybe open up and restrict and perhaps it's going to be this back and forth until we have some um, uh, innovations of science that help us go back to um, or help us get to a place that is more familiar to how we're no how we were living prior to this. Then we have meaning. This meaning part in terms of illness can be about um, control, like how much control do I have, right? A lot of us felt like um, like we had no control when we had to stay at home, right? That like it was this loss of like, I can't make decisions for myself anymore, right? That, um, but it was also fear, right? Fear could show up and start controlling us, right? That we were scared of getting coronavirus or maybe we weren't scared at all. And so we felt like we had lots of control and we kept doing what we were doing, right? But all of that is meaning making. And then the other thing is about stigma, right? Think about if you've ever been out recently and you accidentally, not accidentally, you had to cough, right? You had to clear your throat or something like that. And you feel immediately like you have to say like, I don't have coronavirus, I promise, right? Like there's this stigma around like, if I have a runny nose, if I have a cough, um, that, you know, what does that mean? Or stigma around decisions we're making. I've made the decision to send my daughters to in-person schooling. Um, and for right now, that was the best decision for us. Um, it was not an easy decision. I worry about the stigma. Are people judging me for sending my kids to in-person schooling? Um, you know, my daughter had a runny nose, so she was sent home, which is why she was home with me yesterday. And so then I was worried, is there stigma about me? I sent, I didn't realize she had a runny nose when I sent her to school. She had a runny nose that's on the COVID symptom list. So she had to come home immediately. She does not have coronavirus, but like are other parents going to know that she got sent home? And is there going to be some stigma around me having sent her with a runny nose, right? Like, so there's layers of stigma um, embedded in this and there's layers of control embedded in this. Um, and what control looks like, right? This is all on a spectrum. And then there's historical data about um, morbidity and mortality. And I think the historical data as it relates to coronavirus is where it becomes very complex because I don't know that we know exactly at this point. It seems like every day we get new information about what the rates of mortality are, um, what morbidity looks like, um, and it's really uncertain. It, it, you know, one day we sort of think like this group of people are less impacted by it. And a few weeks later, we hear that, nope, they're equally impacted. And that creates complexity, right? When we hold the historical data of an illness that is so new, how do we then, um, you know, understand this illness and how do we acknowledge the uncertainty of it, right? Um, that we don't know very much about it because it is novel. And so we are sort of learning as we go along, we're trusting the science that's coming out on a day-to-day -day basis, but sometimes that can feel like a moving target too. And so these illness experiences down here on the bottom are interacting with the family experiences. And those are all very complex interactions that then inform how we show up and um, respond to the pandemic that we're living in. So next, um, I want to jump into the biopsychosocial spiritual model. This is going to be a little bit quicker because this is sort of how I start my sort of about my self evaluation, right? How am I doing today? Um, and so I want to sort of offer this to you guys as a way to check in um, with how you're doing. So the biopsychosocial spiritual model was developed by George Ingle, <clears throat> George Ingle, and it was expanded in the late '90s to include spirituality. So the original model was just the biopsychosocial model. Um, and so um, this is a systemic lens through which families and their health are viewed as interacting, adapting, and changing over time. Um, so biological aspects of health, this is physical health, genetics, and biochemistry as influences of health. And so when we're thinking about the bio biopsychosocial spiritual model during a pandemic, what I often think here is what am I doing on a day-to-day -day basis to improve my biological health. What am I doing? Am I, so I know that um, this is a stressful time. We all know this is a stressful time, right? And so when we are stressed out, our immune systems are more compromised. There's lots of research that supports that. And so what am I doing to improve my immune system? What am I doing to keep the biological processes in my body in a functioning order? What am I doing to manage my stress so that there's less impact on my immune system. We also know that sustained, sustained stress causes inflammatory responses, right? So 
If you have something like an autoimmune disorder that can be more sensitive to an inflammatory response, thinking about what you're doing to manage your stress to reduce that inflammatory response is really important. This can be, what am I eating? What kind of activities am I involved in? Um, how am I sleeping? Um, all of these things, all of these lifestyle choices that can have physical, um, uh, positive physical impact. So that's sort of where I start when I'm checking in. What are sort of the, bio, the things that I'm doing at a biochemical level to shift my body, to make it more adaptable and responsive to the stress that I know it's experiencing right now? Then we have psychological aspects. These are um, personality, temperament, and comorbid mental health conditions. When I think about the psychological aspect in, um, during the pandemic, I think about what am I doing for my mental health, for my wellness? And you can see how some of these are, um, all of these actually are interconnected. So if I'm eating well, if I'm resting, if I'm exercising, that impacts my biological health, but it also impacts my psychological wellness. If I'm doing those things and managing my stress, we know that if we are less stressed, we are feeling better psychologically. So I ask myself, what am I doing? And sometimes the psychological aspect expands beyond what I'm doing for the biological aspect. It can be things like, you know, reading the, um, you know, reading poetry, or it can be things like um, scheduling, um, you know, FaceTimes or Zoom meetings with colleagues to make sure that I'm, you know, doing my own um, processing of difficult cases, that I'm not carrying the, the, the burden of my work by myself when I was used to being in a practice and collaborating with coworkers, right? That some of that has been taken away. And so what am I doing to consult on cases, to talk about difficult things, to make sure that I'm managing my stress um, in, a, in a, an effective way? Next is the social aspect. So this is familial, community, sociocultural factors, and environmental context. So I think about what am I doing to um, support myself in a social aspect? I am an extrovert trying to navigate a pandemic and learning introvert ways, right? Like this is sort of like, I have sort of taken this as like challenge accepted. Like I am the parent who um, I plan play dates all weekend long. That is how I live. I love being around lots of kids and lots of parents that, I mean, soccer and um, we live a few blocks from the bay going to the beach. Like this was what my life was like before the pandemic. And so having to create a smaller world was a definite shift for me, especially in terms of how I fed the social aspect of my well-being. And so figuring out ways to connect familially and with community, um, identifying sociocultural factors for us in our family um, when uh, when the racial injustice really came to the forefront during the pandemic I started having conversations with my daughters I'm half Mexican um, and my daughters started having really interesting questions and we started making time to talk about um, what it means for them to be Mexican and to be white appearing and what does it mean for us that we have um, black and brown family members, um, and what does all of this mean in terms of who they are, right? And so for me, some of what my social, the social aspect was, was like this diving into identity with my kids, right? And learning and pulling out, um, finding connection with community in tangible ways rather than in interactive ways. So pulling out photo albums and showing them pictures of their ancestors. And, you know, my dad has lots of news clippings and those sorts of things. And so showing them all of that and talking about sort of this embeddedness and finding um, connection in our social um, identity through our lineage was one way that we sort of found connectedness in that social aspect. And then lastly is spiritual aspects. So this is beliefs and meaning ascribed to an illness. And I think, I don't know for others, but for me, this was really impactful. I, um, as an extrovert, I really like going to church on Sundays and feeling that community sense. I love singing at church. I grew up um, in choir and doing performances. And so church for me is like a little bit of performing every week, right? I get to go and I get to sing and um, it makes me feel good. And being in community is very fulfilling for me, seeing the same people every week. Um, and reflecting on faith and values was really important. And so when um, not going to church in person was no longer available, finding new ways to connect in that same way um, or in a similar way that created that same meaning was really important. 
Um, and so these are sort of questions you might ask yourself or that you might invite some exploration into as you're thinking about sort of how you're coming to face this. So I've got three tips that I'd like for you guys to take home and this will wrap up our presentation for today. Um, the first one is this idea of spoon theory. This is used in chronic illness. Um, it's this idea that um, when we are faced with an illness experience, we are given 15 spoons and those are the spoons that we can fill for the day. And uh, when we're out of spoons, then um, that that's sort of all the bandwidth we have, right? So, um, we have 15 spoons because it's the capacity, right? After 15 spoons, we're exhausted, we're burnt out, we're not showing up maybe in our best way. And so what, how much, how many spoons does each task take? Um, how many spoons does it take to um, do certain things? And the spoon theory is nice uh, when I think about like, um, I've got 15 spoons today and I've got um, a request for 28 spoons, right? Like what are the things that I'm not able to do? And this is the reality, right? Is that um, I early on had a mentor that taught me how to say no. I still struggle with that. It is still very hard. I'm not saying I'm an expert in saying no, but learning to say no or learning to say yes to the things that matter. Like, like what I have to fill my spoon with and what I want to fill my spoon with might be two different things. And it's okay sometimes to go with what you want rather than what you have to do. Um, and that sometimes that can be more important, especially during these times when we are being pulled in so many directions. Um, and this has a checklist. I think, um, Vanessa, you're gonna share the PowerPoint with them so they'll have access. But thinking about you know, getting out of bed maybe takes one spoon. Maybe for some it doesn't take any spoons at all. Maybe calling a loved one takes two or three spoons. Um, so thinking about it has like a list of different activities and thinking about how many spoons each of those take um, on any given day is really helpful. The next thing is um, this metaphor that I use with clients about glass and rubber balls and juggling balls that um, some are glass and some are rubber. Some will bounce back and some, if you drop them, will break or shatter, right? And so thinking about, similar to spoon theory, thinking about which are the balls that I have to keep juggling in the air, which are the ones that I can toss to other people, those might be some glass balls, right? Um, those might be some rubber balls, and which are the ones that I can drop? Which are the ones that I can drop and let bounce back and will be available there, right? So um, one of my best friends in the whole world, um, she and I talk often about like, as, um, as much as we love each other, that we are each other's rubber ball, that there are times um, she's an academic also, she's got three kids, she just had a baby during, um, just a month ago she had a baby, right? And so, um, you know, I check in with her and sometimes she doesn't respond and that's okay. And she checks in with me and sometimes it takes a long time for me to respond. And we sort of know like, we're each other's rubber balls, like we will be there, we are not offended by that. Um, you know, but it takes some evaluation and it takes some explicit conversation, right? Like it's sort of a joke between she and I now. It's like, hey, thanks for being a rubber ball. Like when we see each other, it's like great to bounce back with you. Like, you know, and that's the way that we connect. Um, we also have times when we call each other and say like, no, 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 this is a glass ball moment. Like I need you to show up. And we acknowledge that also, right? That the balls can shift, like the importance of things can shift over time and that we need to have some flexibility in that. Um, then the last one, and this is probably my favorite. So the last two that I've talked about, spoon theory and juggling of the balls are very individual sort of metaphors. Um, family and community check-ins are infinitely important during this time. Um, and there is this idea that in our family, we need to show up as 100%. For our family to function, we need to be at 100%. Um, I am... Uh, a single mother. I'm very lucky that my ex-husband is fantastic and very supportive, but we run two separate households. So in my household, it's important that me and my kids show up as 100%. And sometimes that means roping him in and saying like, you know, this morning I said I have this presentation today, like you got to be on call if anybody needs anything. But what I do with the kids and I, and at some point, and I do this with my parents right now too, because they're part of our family system, we say we need to be at 100%. 100% means we are connected, we are supporting each other, the household feels safe, it feels secure, it feels comfortable. What do we need to get there? Well, I'm very busy this week, I have a big presentation, I'm only bringing 30%. 
Like I'm only bringing 30%. So I've got 70% that I need to make up. So I might go to my parents because there are other adults in the system. My kids are, you know, four and six. It's not appropriate to sort of lean on them. I'll go to my parents and say like, what percentage can you bring in? They say, we can bring 40%. Great. So we're up to 70% now. There's 30% that still needs to be filled. So what needs to happen there? So the 30% that needs to be filled, maybe that's we order takeout for the week, that I'm just clearing my plate of having to cook dinner this week and we're ordering takeout. Maybe it's we are, um, you know, we're going to have more family dinners because I know that family dinners relieve my stress, right? So that sort of helps shift and, and my parents can commit to making dinners. Um, and then we talk to the kids about like, what can they do? Well, um, Amelia Rose and Adeline, they can clean their rooms and that's really helpful. When we have a clean house, we all feel less stressed. And so they can clean their rooms. So that's like their 10% they're bringing. But thinking about how we get to 100%, and sometimes that means outsourcing. Sometimes it means ordering food, getting our groceries delivered, hiring, you know, if you're comfortable or if it's available to you, hiring someone to come clean your house, making sure that you make time for eight hours of sleep, making sure that you're protecting all of those things that you need, right, from that biopsychosocial spiritual evaluation to be able to show up as 100% for your family system. And that might mean that you individually are bringing 30%, but that as a family, you're getting to that 100% because the 100% is where we are connected and we feel um, like we can rely and depend on one another. And that's the safe environment and that's a secure environment where we can attend to each other's needs, wants, and desires. And that's really what's gonna support us in this process of uncertainty. So that is the end of my presentation today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing. These are the references and I'm happy to share those. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing at this point and open up to any questions that anyone might have. Great. If we could start, there's one um, in the chat from Dr. Storm um, in relation to the the spoon um, the spoon theory. Uh, she asks, "How do we get better at being more realistic about how many spoon how actually how many spoons things take?" So she feels yeah. the pressure of larger tasks are only uh, equal to one spoon when in reality, that task may, may be more. So how do we realistically yep. look at that? Yeah, so th that is a fantastic question. I, my go-to at this point in, in my pandemic, like this is like my, um, my crisis plan is to always assume that I need more spoons than what it's gonna take. I'd rather have spoons left over at the end of the day than be overly depleted. When we're thinking about spoon theory from a, a a chronic illness position. The idea is that if you overuse your spoons, if you have 15 spoons and you use 18 spoons, that there's ramifications for the next day, right? That you're Ill, you might have an illness flare up, a symptom flare up, that you might feel more fatigued the next day, that you might not be able to show up for the next week, however long it is, right? And so I try to sort of use that um, for my own, for my own grace right now, right? Is that I I need to be able to show up every day full and recharged and knowing that things are taking me longer now. When we think about that first slide about having three minutes and 24 seconds of uninterrupted work time, right? That I know that things are taking harder, taking longer and taking more energy because there are more interruptions now. So I am giving myself some grace to give myself more spoons for tasks. If something used to take me two spoons, I might call it a three spoon activity now. Um, and, and I need to be okay with that. And some of that is telling other people, like, you can have all the expectations you want of me, but I'm going to instead give myself some grace and extra time because in any given day, you know, we might take a hard left and not, you know, not be able to do it, right? I thought yesterday I would have protected time. I thought it would work out fine. Usually my daughter doesn't come out and ask to sit on my lap in the middle of the school day. She stays inside and I get to do my work, right? And so that was an unexpected task, but I had given myself three spoons for that task. So for her to come out, I was able to then pause and turn to her, right? And so I think it is planning for the unexpected. And I, I do think there's nothing better than getting to the end of the day and having a few spoons left to maybe do other things. But I, yesterday we had enough energy at the end of the day that we were able to go and, you know, socially distance, say hello to our neighbors on a walk. And that was really meaningful for my kids. Um, right. And so 
but having not, I didn't have to work on my project in the night because earlier in the day I had said, this is going to take me three spoons, right? That I had protected time for it. Um, and that freed up space to do some of that social connection that was important later. Um, so I do think that we need to give, and we need to offer that grace to other people. If I usually expect some sort of turnaround that I get to say like, this might take you longer. How long do you need for this task? Um, and just get comfortable with that. The urgency of life, I think I have um, fully rejected now in the time of a pandemic. <laughs> Thank you for that. And we do want to respect everyone's time. We will stay here and answer um, more questions yes. with Dr. Kuhn, but if you need to jump off, we appreciate you joining us and I will be sending out her PowerPoint presentation so yeah. you'll, you'll have those references. But one other question uh, that popped up uh, at the beginning when you talked about knowing when to speed up, knowing when to slow down, and you referenced that Morgan Harper Nichols poem. Do you have the, the name of that poem? There are several people that are interested in that. It is unnamed, unfortunately. I can give you the book and the page number. Perfect. So I'll it is uh, we can find one four, page 142. So I will, I will make sure to get that to you, Vanessa. Thank you. I'll start with, um, I was struck when you were talking about the family giving 100% and what you need to do collectively to get to that what about the notion of, of being okay that you don't reach 100? Like, how does that fit into how we approach this? Yep. You know, 100 is the goal and we're doing our best. So 100% so doesn't mean that we're a perfect family. It means 100% is like, it's sort of like filling your gas tank, right? That like, we, we need to make sure the gas tank is full. Um, and we need to acknowledge that like, we need there are things that have to happen, right? That, um, and we need to know what needs to happen for those things to be able to be sustained. So, um, you know, obviously 100%, we don't wanna set up unrealistic expectations or this idea of perfection. When I'm talking about 100%, I'm meaning my kids are bathed and clothed and fed and they are where they need to be on time. You know, so sort of that's, that's what I'm talking about there and that I'm able to sort of show up for the responsibilities that I need to show up for. Um, and so the idea of the 100% is that at any given moment um, in relationship, and particularly I use this with couples, that the couples need to be at 100%, but the division of labor can't always be 50-50. As much as we would like this idea that everything is always equal, the reality is it's not. That my partner might have a big deposition due and can only give 10% this week, or that my partner, or that I might have a big presentation and I might only have 40% to give this week in the relationship. And so we are working at a deficit, right? We're sort of working in the red because we're not filling that 100%. And so what do we need to bring in? Instead of us getting in a fight or in an argument about, you know, well, who's gonna make dinner and who's gonna do the laundry and who's gonna do this? What can we do to sort of outsource, right? Um, there is a, I'll, I'll share the episode. There's a fantastic Brene Brown um, uh, episode where she talks about this idea of the 100%. Her metaphor works a little better because she has adult kids who can pull more labor. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a mother with a four and a six year old, the, what I invite my kids to do looks a little bit different. Um, and the ways in which I have to draw in other people, right? That I know that I have to show up in my relationships with my family we need to show up as 100%, um, but that looks different for us. And so thinking about how it might look different for different family structures is really important and how it might look different for intergenerational families, right? That I get to call upon my parents to help and my sister to help, um, but that we all get to get to that 100% together um, to make sure that we're creating sort of a, an environment we're not vulnerable to conflict or disagreement, right? The idea of 100% is like, this is what we need to be able to show up as um, thoughtful and considerate to one another and not stressed out and burnt out and on edge. And um, that can, that creates that vulnerable experience for conflict. Thank you. Yeah. I also want to acknowledge that for this group, particularly that women tend to carry the emotional labor more often um, in relationships, in any kind of relationship, that can be in work environments, that can be in parenting, that can be in romantic relationships and familial relationships. And so also thinking about some of that exhaustion is related to carrying the weight of emotional labor also, that, which is unseen labor, because um, it's not actually tangible tasks. Dean Williams? 
Yes, I would say, I, again, thank you for this presentation. This is most enlightening. Uh, the spoons and the rubber balls and the glass balls, while I've heard of them in the past, you put them in a context that uh, causes me to think and to perhaps better manage my life. Um, and I am intrigued by what you've presented be, as a, when you talk about 100% and relying upon others, um, even at this stage of the game, I'm learning more and more about delegation, you know, <laughs> being able to delegate responsibilities. Uh, it's easier in the workplace, I think, than it is at home. Uh, being a single person who lives alone and all of my life rests in my hands, you know, having that notion, everything, um, I'm responsible for everything. And so the notion of reaching out to others to help fill that 100%, it's challenging me right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's challenging me right now in a good way, in a very good way. And so, so I thank you for that. I thank you for that. That's yeah. intriguing. I, um, I once had a therapist, I was very pregnant with my daughter and I was, you know, talking to my therapist about this big trans, my oldest daughter, I was talking to her about this big transition I was about to make, um, into motherhood. Right. And she said, just remember that other than to your daughter, you're not as important as you think you are. And at first I was like offended. And she was like, but really, cause I was like, I had lots of research. I was in the middle of my PhD. I had my dissertation. I had lots of research projects. I was doing accreditation, right? I had all these things. And she was like, but you can walk away from those, that those people will figure out how to pick up the slack of your work um, so that you can focus on parenting your daughter for showing up for this transition in your life, right? But I, it was almost like I needed to hear, like I wasn't as, I had thought I was more important and that the whole, all these systems would crumble if I took a pause. Um, I think sometimes that we do think that like, um, not that, it's not that we're not important, but that like people will figure out when we need to step back, we will figure out how to readjust systems to still be supportive. And so figuring out what that looks like um, and I think for, um, and I can speak for myself as a, an ambitious and courageous and sort of, you know, leaning in woman that that's a very hard thing to sit with, right? Um, I want my hands in all the pots and I want to be sort of directing the ship. Um, but I get to also give myself grace of like, I get to step back and I get to model um, attempting balance. I don't know that I ever achieve balance, but I get to model attempting balance for my kids so that maybe they might get closer to it than, than I do. Um, when they're older. Thank you. I'd love to draw attention to uh, Sharon's comment in the chat. She found the family illness model diagram helpful, um, but wished that it had included human development issues. So um, mm. it appears that she's living in a home right now uh, under COVID orders with teens. Um, and everything that that kind of adolescence um, development is bringing. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, so the family illness model actually does incorporate um, in the uh, individual development sort of portion of it, um, right, in individual and family development, I sort of touched on um, sort of the outer ends. This is my own probably taken for granted reality that I don't have teens around, so I often forget about that. I, I imagine in my mind teens being so much more self-sufficient, and yet I also know they're not. Um, <laughs> But uh, having never parented a teen, I often forget about that. Um, but it, t I think adolescence is a difficult time. I think even before COVID, adolescence was a difficult time because so many adolescents are going to virtual platforms for connection, um, you know, using social media, using video games, using all sorts of different um, technologies to interact. And so what does it look like now? Um, to have sort of the human interaction maybe stripped away or diminished and sort of relying on these um, types of interacting. I would love to hear more from Sharon um, if she's willing to sort of share about like what challenges, um, 
you know, she sort of alludes to, or not alludes to, but sort of shares like isolating from peers and missing important rights and passages um, that I wonder what those might look like instead, right? That we're sort of reimagining what these look like. We've seen, you know, birthday parades for kids, right? Where we sort of do these drive-by parades and um, we've been having virtual ceremonies, which doesn't feel the same for those of us who have been to a real high school graduation, right? If we've been to an in-person stadium high school graduation, that um, the virtual ones feel a bit anticlimactic, I think. But how might we suspend our own expectations from our past experiences to then support our kids in understanding how to make the experience they do have special and meaningful for them? Um, also thinking about, um, I think, isolation in adolescence is a, a, a serious concern as it relates particularly particularly to mental health. Um, uh, how do we support connectivity at a time when adolescence is um, a developmental process of trying to gain independence? So as a parent, adolescents are trying to gain independence because they're preparing to launch at 18, right? Um, and so they are distancing from their parent to try to test independence. But in that, that, that might also lead to isolation when there aren't the so social interactions that were previously available to them. And so some of this is about becoming very creative, having dialogue about, you know, wanting to interact with your adolescent, um, not because you're trying to sort of overparent them or be too involved in their life, but rather as an acknowledgement of like wanting to support them in their launching into independence. Um, and how might that look different now in the time of COVID? Um, and how might they be connecting with community? I always think that with adolescents, we don't give them enough credit that we can, they can tolerate more conversation than parents usually give them credit for. Um, and so it's really about, um, you know, talking to them and connecting with them in a way that they can be responsive and um, uh, sort of connecting back with. And there's some great books about like how to talk so your teen will listen and how to talk so your kid will listen. Um, some of those are really great books for parenting around adolescents. There's also a book that I really like. It's an attachment-based parenting book. It's meant for younger kids, but I think it works for parents with adolescents too. I and mean, it's called Parenting from the Inside Out. And it's about sort of exploring your own sort of experiences with attachment and how that can shape how you inform, um, shape and inform how you show up for your child in your parenting style to support them in having connected um, and safe, secure attachment experiences in their lifetime. Thank you. Sharon, I saw you unmute. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you. No, I think that Dr. Kuhn, um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, that's fine. Um, hit on a lot of it. I think a lot of it that, that I am feeling as um, a professional, but also as a parent with teens and young adults is also in that diagram. I just loved it, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, first time I've seen it is also a sense of grief that we're seeing because that age in particular, they, they monitor and they see the different rites of passage, um, graduation ceremonies or DMVs that were shut down. So a lot of the uh, um, kids who were expecting to have their driver's license or mm -hmm. um, proms and things that, that, you know what, like we have a better sense as adults of our genealogy and heritage and and while, yes, absolutely spot on, did all of these developmental stages hit for other people in history that didn't have such privilege? Absolutely. Um, but at the same time, trying to acknowledge the grief that they are experiencing, but also the loss of different um, peer relationships where they sometimes will find their identity, especially that age group. Yeah. Yeah, I also want to highlight, Sharon, that there might also be experiences of relief for those kids who maybe were socially um, struggling in person, that the relief of not having prom, the relief of not having these big social experiences, right, that there might be a full range of responses, not just grief. Um, and so being really curious about that, like, is there some relief about, like, well, I don't, I don't have to take the, the driver's license test quite yet, or there's not this pressure to get the car, right? I, I think a lot of what you're describing are sort of the um, more dominant sort of um, messages or experiences that kids are having, right? The grief um, and sort of these unmet milestones that um, are being postponed, but 
for some kids, they might be having a different experience of that. And so as we're talking to our adolescents, making sure that we're making space to hear their full experience, um, that might have some more nuance of like um, what's in the grief is maybe not about missing the dance, but in like um, other things that were gonna be happening there, right? Like, and, and so trying to figure out what it was and like how those might be recreated on a smaller scale or in a different way. Um, to, to create that sort of same benchmark experience that they were hoping or longing for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And piggybacking upon that, uh, Robin had a question about kind of that shift from in-person to virtual and how it's not the same. So any insight on how either we suspend our expectations that it, it needs to be the same or how do we approach that so that the benefit is still there for us, even though yeah. the modality is different. Yeah, it's so challenging. Um, I, I think what I tend to do is I try to draw on gratitude that I still get some part of what I want, what I needed or desired, right? Like um, from, um, from that support that I was like looking for that I was relying on previously, like, do I still get to get some part of that? Um, and then I think the other part too is um, finding smaller, more intimate ways of connecting. So I know for me when um, church, you know, closed down and went to virtual, um, when in-person sort of meeting went to virtual, that I reached out to members of my congregation and said, it's really hard for me to sit and watch the video and then feel like empowered or impacted by it. Like, that's just not for me. I loved like the dialogue when you're walking out of church and like, oh, that was a great sermon. And this part spoke to, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so starting like small groups where we just met a couple times a week or even a text group where we'd text about like after the video, you know, so our church is doing daily masses that they're releasing and they're like 15 minutes long. Um, or sort of 15 minute sermons throughout the week. And then there's a longer one on Sunday. And so starting a text group um, with members of my congregation to talk about like, did anybody catch this? It was really impactful to me or um, this thing had me really thinking. Um, so creating conversations about the virtual sort of information. The other thing too is watching it in the community that I do have access to. So, um, you know, watching it with my daughters and having conversation with them about it in our home is another way that we've tried to create some community around um, those missed social experiences. Thank you. We'll, we'll end with uh, Maria's question from the chat about um, the notion of repaying support that she received, mm -hmm. wanting to do that immediately, even if it isn't being sought. Um, and so how do you kind of manage that pressure of returning the favor? Yeah, that um, really resonates for me. I'm a caretaker by nature, right? It's how I ended up being a therapist. And so ha being cared for is very challenging for me. Um, and so I think some of it is inviting yourself to sit in the discomfort of like, it's okay to not repay right away. Um, that um, sometimes the receiving is the repayment, like giving, being able to receive without having to give back can be very impactful to the person who's giving to you, right? That um, there is a dual experience in the giving and in the receiving and receiving with no burden of repayment um, can be very meaningful for the person who's giving to you. Um, and so acknowledging that, um, I think that becomes more complicated when we talk about family systems where there might be expectations about repayment. And in those cases, I do recommend having explicit conversations around um, that I, I want us to be able to give to each other without the burden of repayment and how do we sort of shift that dynamic in our family um, so that we can give right um, and without sort of this um, silent responsibility to, to repay. Beautiful. That will conclude this session of the lifelong learning. We are going to meet again next month. So that's October the 8th and we're going to focus on the November election. Our speaker will be the Dean of the School of Public Policy with Pepperdine, Pete Peterson. Uh, if you were with us um, four years ago, he spoke, same subject, uh, different players, and we'll see what those results will be. But to be clear, this is a nonpartisan look at the current state of politics and the election and 
um, even though some of these polarizing results from the polls uh, may, may spark a few of us, um, I think it's important that we, we understand better what our political culture looks like, um, no matter our affiliation. So you will receive an email to invite you all to join us for that Zoom. Um, so until we are together again, please stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, look forward to an email from me with uh, all the material supports from today's lecture. So thank you, ladies. We'll see you next time.